This morning we're um, talking about anger, which is, uh, which is, we're going to talk more in a minute, but it's no joking matter, but it reminds me of the one that I've heard about the, the old couple, old couple one evening, they sit down and in a moment of vulnerability and honesty, the old man says to his wife of many, many years, he says, honey, I, I don't know how you've dealt with me on these days when I've come home in such a foul, angry mood. And been mean to you when I shouldn't have been and all this. And you've just always handled it so well. What's been your secret? And she says back to him, well, actually when you're in that kind of mood, I go and clean the toilet. <laughs> and he says, what? That's your secret? She says, yeah, yeah. Because I use your toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, maybe that one needs to be flushed. <laughs> we're we're going to get better from there. All right, hold on, stay with me. Don't, don't leave me here. Today we're, we're talking about anger, and it, it is actually a very important topic in relationships. We get in our first reading today from 1 Corinthians uh, thirteen five, where it talks about how love is slow to anger. And this idea of what anger does in relationships is really, really important and powerful. And something, if we're, we're doing this series where we're talking about um, having great relationships, having better relationships. And part of that is to make sure we're dealing with anger in the right way in whatever relationships we're talking about, whether it's couples or whether it's family or whatever it is, dealing with anger appropriately really, really matters. And um, so that's what we're talking about. We're doing this as part of this sermon series we've been doing. We've got one more sermon after today, but if you haven't been with us, we've been talking really about taking God's love deeper into our lives in a way that will impact relationships. And we talked week one about how it's all about love and what our mission and goal is in life around that. The second week, we talked about how Jesus loves and how we sort of look at that as a model and try to emulate that. And the third week, we talked about loving with words. Today, we're going to deal with anger. And next week, we're going to talk about forgiveness and how that plays out in these different relationships. But today is anger. And anger is one of these emotions that is probably the misunderstanding most misunderstood, misapplied emotion that there is. Because it's a strange one, right? It's one of these ones where we would say, it's not sinful if it's handled right, but it can be sinful if it's not handled right. It's, it's that kind of a deal, right? And there, we look at it, God made us to have a capacity for anger. And the truth is, if you read the Bible cover to cover, you will see many places where God is angry. And really, deep down, you want him to be angry, right? You would be upset if God was not angry at some of the things we see in the world. And we can talk about free will and why things happen in another sermon someday. But, but this idea that God does get angry, and we see God get angry in Scripture in a number of different places, right? And it really would be unloving if we weren't angry at times. Like, there are times when anger is evidence of love, right? If you're children have something going on with them. I mean, like somebody's attacking them or doing something wrong with them. It would be wrong not to get angry, right? There are times when it would be heartless to not be angry. It would be, you're just having apathy if you're not angry in some of these situations. So it's one, it's kind of a strange deal. It all comes down oftentimes to, to what we do with it. There are ways that are sinful to respond to it and there are ways that are not. It's a matter of which way we go on this. And when we start thinking about our responses, um, I think it's easy for a minute to maybe paint out the sort of two extremes, and we're going to talk about some stuff in the middle. I worked at a church where uh, there was a couple, um, Nikki and Silla Lee, that used to teach the pre-marriage course and do all this. And when they would get to the section talking about conflict and marriage, they always talked about these two extremes, and they talked about the hedgehog and the rhino. And the hedgehog is the person who sometimes, when they, when they get under attack, or something's going on, they just put out their, you know, they just ball up on the ground and do whatever they're going to do, but they don't do anything else. They just take it. And the rhino is the one that charges. Just, I don't care what the, you know, enough facts, I've got enough, I'm angry, and just attacks. Those are kind of the two extremes. The one where you sort of do, you just swallow it, which will destroy your health, by the way, I think. You know, you're taking it on board, you're not doing anything with it. And the other extreme is where you just attack and go. And we want to talk about something else because if we want our relationships to be great, if we want our relationships to be better, we've got to come up with better ways to deal with it. And scripture has something to say on that. And so what I want to do for the whole of this sermon is talk about four different reflections 
for you to think about with respect to anger in your relationships and the anger that you face in life. And the very first one of these is probably the most, in some sense, the most important because the rest of it's irrelevant. If we're not going to go on with step one, is this idea that we have some measure of control in how we respond, right? This idea that you can't say, well, he, he always makes me scream at him with the stuff he does, or she always makes me... You get to choose your response in this stuff, right? I mean, think about um, for a minute just some of the scripture passage. I'm going to quote from Proverbs a number of times today. From Proverbs 29, 11, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. And what's implicit in that is you have a bit of a choice. You get, to, you get to choose in that, right? And what you do with that. And, you know, there are lots of ways we can think about that. I've quoted him before, and I'm going to quote him again probably because I'm so impacted by him. But Viktor Frankl, the, the great psychologist and um, neurologist who was in three or four different concentration camps during World War II, went on to write all these great things. He talks about this, and I would think somebody who's been where he's been can say this. He talks about how the one thing nobody can take from you is this ability to choose. And this is what he says. He says, everything can be taken from a man but one thing. To choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. To choose one's own way. That you have this ability to choose. And again, I've said this before. The very, the very first part of my legal career, I was a litigator. I don't do that anymore, but, but I used to do that. And um, I used to have this, for five years, I did this one case five years. And I had this one grumpy old guy up in Pittsburgh that I was against. And he used to call me up and he would always be angry and he would always do all this stuff. And I literally, next to my phone, put this little image that was more or less a reminder that I'm not Pavlov's dog. <laughs> that part of what it means to be human is we get stimulus in, we get to choose what we're going to do with it. It's not just straight out in some direction. And we may want to say that, oh, I'm, I'm Irish. You know, we, we have tempers or whatever. We may want to pretend that it's this way, but it's not. Part of what being human is, is we get this moment of choice. And everything we're going to say today doesn't matter if you don't buy onto this. But there are lots of places in Scripture and different, and different places where we hear things like St. Paul in Ephesians 4 will say, be angry, but don't sin. And if you're not able to control your response, why is Paul saying, be angry, but don't sin? There's, we, we have the ability to go in and choose what we're going to do with it. That's sort of the first thing for us to reflect on, is we have this ability to control. And, and the second thing I think that we should remind ourselves right along with this reflection is the great cost. If you decide you're going to have the luxury of just letting loose, I don't care what the damage is. I don't care about anybody, whatever. I'm just going to vent and blow to the sky. All the carnage and collateral damage and all the stuff that's going to happen is going to be costly. It, it's, going to, it's going to have its consequences. And I think if we can pause and reflect on what the cost is, it'll begin to get us to think about it. Proverbs 29, again, is, is a, a, a passage that talks a lot about anger. But 29, 22 says, a hothead causes much transgression. And all of us have been there. Let's be honest. All of us have been there. You've had a moment where you've worked too long. It's been a hard week. Maybe you skipped a meal and you're hungry and stuff's been building and you, you blow. And it, it, every, I'm convinced everybody's probably had that moment. But how much damage gets done in that moment, right? There are all kinds of losses that can take place. You can lose reputation, Respect, jobs, sales, clients, all these kinds of things. And sadly, even uh, damage or even lose love of family members <coughs> if you go into that place. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. So we can stop and think about, we've, we've got some measure of control. But we also need to just stop and think about what a powerful thing it is when it's mishandled and how much damage and cost it can have. Which leads us maybe to begin to think about the third thing, and that is this idea that we really need to stop and pause and reflect when we have these things. Whatever it is, something that's driving us in anger, we need to have this ability to, to, to stop and to re reflect on before we react. This one chapter we're talking about from Proverbs um, keeps going. It says, one version of translation says, a stupid man gives free rein to his anger, 
And a wise man waits and lets it grow cool. And this idea with this is not that we're going to avoid our anger, that we're going to, I'm not, I don't think this is saying put it off forever. I mean, St. Paul is going to go on to say again in Ephesians that you shouldn't really let the sun go down on your anger. And a lot of people will say that's really saying don't let 24 hours go or don't, don't let some sustained period go. Because if you hold on to anger and never process it or deal with it, it's going to turn to bitterness. And then you're into a whole other league, right, of stuff, of what it's going to do to you and all this. But this idea that we need to stop and reflect. And if you're like me, maybe you've learned the hard way. When you're angry with somebody or somebody's done something, do not send that email that night. <laughs> Sleep on it, right? The only thing worse than that is doing that if you've had a drink, right? <laughs> don't, for sure don't do that, right? You want some time to, to, to hit pause and to think things through. And you might ask, well, what are, we, what are we doing during that pause period? Well, maybe part of it is just trying to understand what's going on. There are lots of people who would tell you, right or wrong, that anger is just a symptom of, of something bigger going on. And, you know, I may have the psychologists in the room say something else to me, but I've always heard that there are only three different things that make us angry. That it's uh, hurt frustrations, and fear. That everything, one way or the other, comes down to one of these three. And we know the hurt part, right? If you've ever been at yourself at the golf course and watched the ball go some way you didn't intend and you get so angry you throw the club, if you've ever done that, or if you've hit your thumb with a hammer and you're trying to throw the hammer away, you get angry because of the hurt or the profound um, psychological hurts that can just reverberate in us for years if we never go deal with them, right? Hurt is a big place that will make a well of anger in us. Or along with that is frustration, which I think is really just thwarting what we're trying to get at. And this one, I think I can say firsthand, is more, um, it's more powerful for people who try to be controlling, goal, the goal setters. That all those people who are trying to make something happen, they're trying to make it get to a certain place and it doesn't, they're, they're getting frustrated and they're getting angry with it. I can think about this for me. Um, I'll tell you about a hum humbling moment for me. It was when, we, when I had uh, twin boys about 15 years ago. Before that, I was sort of cocky and saying, well, I mean, I'm great getting by with a little sleep. I can function well. You know, I'm, I can handle a few days of sleep deprivation. I'm good. The part about that I didn't realize was it was because I can control it. If I can get, I'm going to get three hours. I know I've got it. It's between here and there, and I've, I can really do a deep dive and get some sleep. That was a whole other thing to go in three hours when you couldn't control it. You got, and I'm convinced this day that these twins had a, a non-spoken language where they'd be like, you're on, next, you know. <laughs> and they would tag team, and you're just, you know, wearing you down. But, it's, but it's, I, we tr the more we try to control things that we don't get, I think there's also a place that leads to anger. That's a whole cause for us to pause and reflect on what that's about and what that means. And the final one is fear. And this one, I think, is probably the most obvious one. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, gets right in your zone. It's a fear thing, and you get angry, you know? And you, I'm sure you quickly pray for them like I do. <laughs> they cut in your zone, and, or they, something that makes you fearful, or, or if it's stuff that you haven't dealt with in the past that's hitting in on fears you have, that stuff can lead to a deep pool of anger. And there's a whole moment here, like a side um, alley here that I want to just mention. I think that if you reflect on these things and you get better at understanding the symptoms, it actually gives us the opportunity to do something that's almost never done, which is figuring out how to be sympathetic with somebody who's angry. So somebody's chewing you out or doing whatever or blowing up on you, and you can say, hmm, I wonder if he's frustrated or if he's fearful or if he's hurt or whatever, and to try to respond with a bit of sympathy rather than just doing the thing that comes natural to us, which is giving back in kind, whatever's going on. But that's, you know, a whole other rabbit trail. The final thing that, that I want to uh, mention today won't be a surprise where I'm going with this, and obviously is hugely, hugely important, maybe the most important in processing anger, is to rely on God. And the 15th chapter of Romans talks about how all encouragement and patience, that these are two things that come from God. And I'm convinced the deeper we go in our relationship with God, 
the more patience we'll have, the more ability we'll have, be able to respond with graciousness without even using a toothbrush. <laughs> that you'll have, and you think about the, the fruit of the Spirit, that it's love, and the very second thing it mentions in Galatians 5 is patience, love and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. The more we can go deeper with God, the more, as some people say, we take on the family resemblance. And this stuff starts to come out of us instead of the other stuff. So I think it, it's really that way. And we've talked about it, I think, on every sermon I've given in this series. But how we are, in some sense, like a, like a uh, tube of toothpaste. And whatever's on the inside, going on with our hearts and with our souls on the inside, that's what's going to come out. As we, particularly as we get under pressure and it starts to squeeze, that's what's going to come out. And you can paint the well a different cover, color, but when you pump it, whatever's down there is coming out. And so I think there are lots of things we can think about what it means. And part of this exercise, I think, we're analyzing ourselves is to maybe ask whatever's coming out of us, what's it say about what's going on in the inside? Some people say if you frequently find yourself giving harsh words, does it mean you're, you've got this deep-seated anger going on in your heart? Or if you're always doing negative words, does it mean your heart is preoccupied with fear? Or if you're always, if you've sort of got a braggart, it's hard. You know, you're saying your tongue is always bragging a bit. Are you insecure? Or if you're giving out judging words, are you guilty? All these different things. What does it say about the things that come out of us again and again to think about? Because we want to worry about what's on the inside. And I think the antidote to that, and this is the final stretch of, of what we're doing today, but is to get more God inside of us so his goodness is in us. And I think the more we receive his love, the more we can give love. The more we understand that our, all of our needs, the deep needs are met by God and his surrounding us, the more we're able to give out in ways we couldn't otherwise, the way we can give grace. Somebody does something really wrong, we're able to give them better than they deserve. That's what grace is. That's, that is the definition of grace. You're getting better than you deserve. And if that's in us, we can give that out. So I think we ask God's spirit to reign in us that way. And I think again and again, we, we seek God's renewal. Earlier on, we, uh, Eric and I were talking about Psalm 51, and we didn't talk about this, but if you ever carry a super big burden, maybe we'll talk about this some next week, and you go to do confession with a priest, always available, it's free, and it's a gift. Um, when I'm done, as an act of gratitude, I always ask people usually to go and say Psalm 51 which is, if you know that psalm, it's the one that allegedly David wrote after Bathsheba and all that whole stuff. And part of what he prays in that is create in me a, a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. And all of this, that's our prayer, right? If we, if we work on asking God to come and redo our heart, reprogram our hearts, make us clean hearts, renew a right spirit within us, we live into that, the stuff that comes out even under pressure will be different. And we talked on week two about Jesus' example. You'll never get a better example than Jesus. He's on the cross being killed, wrongly, being spat upon, mocked, all this other stuff. He's forgiven the people that are killing him. That's what's coming out. And the more of that we get in us, the more of the good stuff is going to come out. The final part about this is finally take it straight on to God. If you need to be angry, why not go yell at God? Now, if you saw the movie The Apostle with Robert Duvall, I'm not saying like that necessarily, but go yell. You know, the Psalms, if you pray the Psalms, somewhere between a half and two-thirds are laments and cries to God. Some of them really angry at God. That's okay. Go do that. He can take it. Go yell at God if you need to about whatever you're angry about. He will use that as a way to heal you. I'm going to end today the way I ended the last sermon, by reading some Philip Yancey. I'm just finishing up this book. I've been reading it for a long time with Philip Yancey on prayer. And I was looking back on my notes of some of the things that I've read in this book. And he talks about anger in this one passage. And I thought it was so appropriate to what we're talking about today that I want to end with it. And if you don't know Philip Yancey, he's a, he's a great guy. He's the editor of Christianity Today. He's written some great books. One of his best books he wrote while he was in his 20s, Where's God When It Hurts? Um, fantastic stuff. But I want to end with a passage from him. Um, this is uh, Philip Yancey talking. He says, A few years ago, I wrote a book on the Old Testament entitled The Bible Jesus Read. 
in which I discussed the cursing psalms that called for revenge on enemies. I described a practice of taking a weekly anger walk on the hill behind my home, during which I would present to God the resentment I felt towards people who had wronged me. Forcing myself to open up deep feelings to God had a therapeutic effect. Usually I'd come away feeling as if I'd just released a huge burden. I wrote in that book, quote, the unfairness no longer sticks like a thorn in, inside me as it once did. I've ex expressed it aloud to someone, to God. Sometimes I find that in the process of expression, I grow in compassion. God's spirit speaks to me of my own selfishness, my own judgmental spirit, my own flaws that others have treated with grace and forgiveness, my pitifully limited viewpoint. I came across that passage just today and had the startling feeling that someone else had written it. You see, it has been several years since I have taken an anger walk. I still stroll on that hill, usually on Sunday afternoons. I check the fox den. I look for signs of beetle damage on the ponderosa pines. I follow animal tracks in the snow. And I still pray, though now it would be more accurate to call them praise walks. In time, the anger melted away. Healing took place, even without my conscious awareness. Let us pray.